What's up, people? GNR TV, streaming done right. It has all the channels that you would want. You know, the regular channels, channels from out of state, pay-per-views, sports, the movie channels, porn. It has over 2,000 channels in general. Over 2,000 channels. $20 a month for two devices now. Not one, but two devices for 20 bucks, and you get all that amazing stuff. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, there's no sports right now. There's not really many pay-per-views. Well, guess what? There is sports because UFC is back. And there's pay-per-views because guess what? UFC is back, and the rest of the sports will be back eventually, and it's worth it. This app is freaking amazing. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I've had it for a little over a year now. I'm never going to get rid of it, and I love it. I love it so much. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, you need to get it. And enjoy the rest of the show. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmare. Jason's mask. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? I have my wonderful, lovely guest, Suze Lanier, with me. Suze, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing great. And we were just talking for like the past 15, 20 minutes had fun, little laughs and stuff. You're great, by the way. You're awesome. Thank you. So are you very patient? You have to be. <laughs> with, with this kind of stuff, I've just learned you just... I've learned patience more than more so with this in my lifetime than just in general because I feel both ends, stuff can happen with technical difficulties. I've had people had to cancel on me like five minutes before the show because of family issues. So I'm... I'm good with that. I'm well-rounded with all that stuff. I'm very patient with it. I understand because I have family too. And sometimes, especially if you have kids in your family, kid can be fine and all of a sudden run, run into a wall and hurt themselves two seconds later. So it's like, hey, it has Sometimes you have to even reschedule, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I, I can't tell you my little dog won't bark, but I'm past uh, the kids' stage. So um, uh, it is a little more peaceful after they grow up. <laughs> yeah, just with like a few guests, they've had kids just, I, as you know, Stuff just random. Kids are just random. Something just randomly happens. And it, it seems like it's always when you're about to do something, like getting ready to lay down and relax. I'm hungry or I fell or I don't feel good. Like, what about two hours ago when you run around the house? Now you don't feel good. <laughs> it's good when you can, when they get old enough and you can say, uh, the refrigerator is in there, but make yourself a peanut buttered sandwich. <laughs> yep. You know, I have two, well, I have three stepchildren, but one's moved out and then two. One's uh, 13 and 17, so I don't have to worry about it. They can cook themselves pretty much. I was, I was moved out from home at 17, so <laughs> I was gone by then on my own. So, you know, I think it's um, uh, good to teach independence. Oh, yeah, definitely. It really is. At a young age, like, for, for example, for me, I had to learn at a young age, just as simple as cooking, because my mother would work. Sometimes you have to work overtime, and it's like, hey, we got to. I'm hungry. I got to make myself something to eat. And but I'm glad that I did learn that now. You know, then of course, as a kid, you're complaining, but now it's like I have all these life lessons that I learned from my parents, and I still learn from my parents as a grown man. And it's it's very useful. As much as you know, teenagers roll their eyes and all that, but they'll know one day, like, oh wow, they, you know, they're not being jerks. They're not being mean. I really need to know how. To I need to learn how, know how to do this stuff. I really need to know how to do dishes because mom's not going to be doing my dishes when I'm on my own, in my own house. Absolutely. You know, I, I, um, my son learned to cook pretty early. I was on the set a lot. I, of course, I had um, people with him, babysitters and stuff. Mm -hmm. But he, he's a great cook now. He's grown. And, man, he can cook just about anything. He's a much better cook than I am. So <laughs> That's good, though. That's good. I feel as a parent, even a step-parent, you want your children, even your nieces and nephews, to be better than what you are, yeah. or, or whatever craft they decide to do. Like, say, for example, if your ch children want to be in acting, 
you'd want them to do better. I'm not saying you did bad at all. Don't take that the wrong way. But you want them, whatever you do, you want your children to do better than you. If they want to follow in your footsteps or do whatever, you because that's just how it is. You want to leave something good for them, better for them, so that when they grow up, they leave something better for their children, and hopefully it passes down generation to generation. Well, in my own case, you know, um, I've had a several different careers, and one of them was music. And I uh, was okay. I, I think I wrote uh, pretty well, songwriting. Um, and But I was always on the piano, and my son, you know, a little toddler, would walk around and pick it up. I, I don't know how much he was picking up. And he's turned out to just be a, a, a very, very fine guitarist. And he, he, before the pandemic, he was playing with a – you know, great, great bands. And, and uh, he's a much better musician than I am. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that if I planted the seed, you mm -hmm. know, made it a flower. <laughs> yeah, and that's awesome. I bet you're real proud of that too. That, that, that has to feel amazing. Like, yeah, you know, I he, do enjoy this, but you know, my child's better, which is great. Yeah. He, he's, he's an incredible human being. So I lucked out. <laughs> that's good. That's great. <laughs> Now, as far as The Hills Have Eyes, have you showed your children this movie? Or did it take you from Well, I, I, uh, I have had stepchildren as well. I'm not in touch with them much uh, these days. But, um, I, uh, you know, I met my husband through the movie The Hills Have Eyes. And so um, the kids would all watch it. So, you know, when it came out, I, my son was really little. I didn't let him see it. Uh, but as a teenager, he saw it, you know. So I don't, I don't even know that he would have been interested in seeing it as a young boy, but when he got older, you know, and he was old enough to watch it, he did. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I was thinking, I wanted to say how old was your, you know, when you first let him watch it, he said in his teen years. See, I started around between the ages of five and seven. But with me, I have, well, I have a few older siblings, but I have my one older brother who was really, in, who was in the horror at the time and like older cousins. And me being the youngest at the time, you want to do what the older kids are doing, follow them around. So I would follow them around. And when we'd have sleepovers, like either at one of my cousin's houses or my mother's house, they'd rent horror movies and they'd let me watch them with them. Their rule was, say, if we're at my, don't wake up aunt so-and-so or my brother, don't wake up mom because you're scared because you're going to get us all in trouble. <laughs> well, I wouldn't wake them up. And I, as far as sleeping arrangements, I don't remember if we just all like, you know, camped out in the living room and slept or whatever but either way i know i didn't sleep alone that was one and two i remember it was creep show part two it was the hitchhiker i have no idea why now because it's funny now but it just scared the crap out of me to where like i would have to have one of them walk into the bathroom right outside the bathroom for me to go to the bathroom but then i'll come back and watch these movies and it's just it grew into such a passion like one of my best friends i consider my brother who's also a co-host on here we started watching movies together from second grade on till now we're 34 years old and we'll still watch movies together. He's out in Colorado. I'm in Albany, New York, but we'll still come on the podcast and talk horror and stuff. And my nephew, his son is about six and he's not letting him watch the stuff we started out with. He's letting him, you know, like he'll watch him, let him watch like the walking dead and just kind of simple stuff and some video games, like baby sets with him getting in there. And I just, I just think it's a beautiful thing. I love the horror community so much. You meet so many amazing, friendly people, the cons, and just how was your experience with that? Have you done cons? Yeah, I've done Comic-Con in New York. Okay. Um, and I've done um, 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 a number of um, horror or uh, other mm -hmm. kinds of cons, Mon Monster Palooza here in Los Angeles. And... Um, um, I enjoy them, but it's a lot of hard work, and um, I fear that uh, they will have the concept. I can already see the concept is being reinvented to be more virtual for now until there's some kind of um, remedy for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I wouldn't attend one now, uh, particularly, well, I wouldn't attend one now at any age, even if I was, you know, 20, I wouldn't go to one because it's a massive group of people in an enclosed environment and everybody's shoulder to shoulder. And um, so I have been doing a lot of interviews uh, through Zoom and um, uh, Cameo where, uh, you know, I can give a private message to somebody. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if, 
any of your listeners or viewers um, uh, are interested in my doing a cameo, I do that. Uh, you can go into cameo Sue's Lanier Bramlett. And, um, um, and so it's a more personal hello to whoever you want to gift it to as a gift or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I think that that's somewhat clever. I've noticed uh, some of the um, horror uh, or some of the promoter uh, rep representatives of us, uh, you know, whether it's um, uh, sci-fi or horror or comedy or whatever, just the performers, actors um, mm -hmm. are trying to put these platforms up themselves but it's all got to be reinvented because it's too dangerous to go to a con right now. Yeah, unfortunately it is. I, I did see a, a, quite a few, maybe two or three of the virtual cons that they're trying now too. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. I haven't tried to check one out yet. It's cool, but it's still like, as far as what I'm going to meet somebody, like say if I was going to meet you at a con and getting your autograph, I, lo I love that face-to-face -face reaction and just that, it's you can't get that over this but this is amazing don't get me wrong like it helped my podcast i run it through this it's just easy i can talk to people all around the world but as far as like the congos you want that personal experience because you you can't really get that through the internet and it's just the feeling the at i just love the atmosphere everything about the cons i love the atmosphere the friendliness the people the fans everybody there just having such a great freaking time and I've never had any drama, no nothing bad about these cons ever for me, at least. Well, uh, they're fun. They're they're a lot of fun. Don't get me work, uh, wrong. A as mm -hmm. a performer, though, they're they're a lot of work, and sometimes you do get somebody that wants to get a little too close, or um, you know, they kind of invade your, you know, your space a little bit. And uh, I can see how it could be uh, health-wise extremely dangerous right now. Oh, but yeah. I usually came home with a cold or something because, it, you know, people wanting selfies and stuff. And that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was always wonderful. I love my fans. Um, uh, but uh, I've had a – I've had a per – personally, I sort of like the virtual – connection because I think you get uh, a more intimate sense of the person at the cons. Mm -hmm. I would have to yell over each person because it's loud in there. Um, we can't do a selfie together, but maybe we could uh, virtually. I'm not sure they're going to work that out, but I, I, I think that it, it uh, I've done parties with my girlfriends and um, a couple, a Shabbat with uh, these different people. And I'd gone to the same Shabbat in person before the pandemic hit and uh, the virus hit. And um, so there was always a long table and I hadn't really gotten a one-on-one -on -one connection with some of the people that were there. And since they started uh, having us do it in a Zoom, I've really gotten to know some of these people much better. So there are perks to it is what i'm saying i didn't mean to ramble on about it but oh no that's fine i don't hate the virtual uh connection and you, i think you could get um a, a lot huger variety of performers that are willing to come on and say hello uh because they don't have to go anywhere they don't have to get on an airplane and be wiped out from staying in hotels and stuff like that so that right there, I do agree with you 100%. Because again, like the way I do my show is just literally from my my attic. So I, I get that 1 million percent literally from the comfort of your own home. Just turn your computer on, talk for a little bit, and go about your day. And you're right about that as far as like with the virtual kind. Like if I get more people because it's like, hey, look, I, I don't have to travel. If I get hungry or thirsty, I can go right to my kitchen right over there. I don't have to wait on it. And just <clears throat> it's... <clears throat> it does have its benefits, don't get me wrong, but I, I just love meeting people in person. And for the first time this past October, we were at a con, me and my wife and my brother, and we actually did the VIP thing for the first time, which, you know, they had the little party and stuff, which was just an amazing time. Yeah. I mean, it's it's open bar. You don't have to drink, of course, but it's, it's, just, it's just cool to see the celebrities like yourself just kind of relax, be loose, kind of let your hair down. And just, you're not just like... And I'm not saying you don't enjoy it, but you're not just sitting at your table signing autographs and kind of just 
You get you get to be a lot more loose. Oh, don't get me wrong. I miss the. I'm a party girl, big party girl, and so you know I love. Uh, it's like a surf. It's like a carnival. You know, it's like a huge, wonderful party, and I do miss that uh, the fun of it. Mm -hmm. But um, um, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I I do miss that. I don't miss the traveling. You know, and I don't. I, I don't miss the. Um, having to sit there for all day long, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's more fun to be a guest at one of these things than it is to actually be a celebrity that's sitting at the table signing because that it, it's good work. I'm, I mean, people would uh, kind of question why you're charging for your picture. Well, I just flew here from LA yep. and it's, it's not that easy and um um and it's really great to meet you but uh yeah buy a picture don't just you know there won't be any selfies without you know some kind of compensation because it's a job but a lot of people don't understand that i i get no i get that one million percent i get i 100 percent get that and i'm just like again i'll go there get my autographs and spend money with the vendors and all that i just i enjoy the whole experience of it and it's just I'm I'm fairly new to it. Like I've only been doing con since maybe for what year are we in? Twenty twenty? Maybe since like twenty thirteen is when I first heard about it. My wife found it online and told me and my brother, like since then we've been going. But it's I do give I do get what you're saying. Like it's like a job. And as far as having I have had a table twice so far now with bringing the podcast there. And like the con that I go to, they they let us in free, but it's a media pass and so panels that they have there we have to be up on the panels as far as like moderating panels which i love it it is fun the only downside of it is like say uh there was a few times i had interviews set up with some of the celebrities there but then it's like i didn't have time because I, I had to be on all these different panels so it's just that's the downside of it but i mean at the same time it gets my voice out there a little bit more just the people that go to these yeah to these panels and I get to rub elbows with the celebrities just sitting up there talking to them bef before, during, and after the panel because they're, I feel they're a little bit more comfortable with me because like, hey, we're on the panel together. We had a good time and, you know, it's it's cool. I I miss that part of it. I like, I, I, would, I would go there right now if I could, I mean, minus the pandemic and just do panels. It's really yeah, fun. I think we'll come up with something and who knows, maybe there's a vaccine soon and everybody will be free to, to, to kick back jumpstart those again more than anything I, I i believe i miss going to a venue and listening to music i mean that uh was when i you know, i can't think of anything more fun than going to a club and having a cocktail and listening to a great band and being in la we've got some amazing venues and my favorite venue called the write-off room just had to close down oh. perm permanently i hope they're moving but anyway and the greatest musicians in the world would stop by and jam and there was no cover charge. You just go in and drink and it was listen to the most incredible music every night. So I, that's, that's gives me a lot of pleasure. So um, I am sad about that, you know, because I, sometimes I just want to be in a bar. <laughs> I, I understand that. I just have, a, I just have a drink at home now, but like, I think one thing I do miss since you mentioned that, as far as a venue, I'm really big into like drag racing. I grew up in it with my father and my older brother. Mm -hmm. And like right now, the track around us that we go to, our home track, it's they're only allowing, say, if you're racing, and then two crew members. So there's no spectators at all. I haven't been there yet. I do plan on bringing my car out there at some point. But it's just, I just miss that, like going there with my father and my brother and just hanging out. And my nephew's, my own nephew goes now and watches. It's like, it's the little, you know, what? this pandemic, it's just like the little things you miss. Like, as far as going out to eat with my wife, I miss that. Like, I'm, I'm the type of person, I'm a homebody. I'd rather eat at home or even if we go out to eat and bring the food home and watch a movie together. But now I just miss going out to eat and just having dinner out to eat because you have, I haven't been able to do it since March, since sometime in March. I know. I mean, don't you miss being waited on? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'll have a, a Grey Goose martini and, a, you know, a Caesar salad. Thank you. <laughs> now you've got to either go pick it up or have Grubhub deliver it or Postmates deliver it. And then you have to make your own damn Grey Goose. I mean, you know, it just <laughs> it's kind of a drag. 
I get it, but it it really does make you. Uh, hopefully, it makes a lot more people appreciate things like that. Like when they go out, say to go out to dinner, you appreciate the wait staff a lot more. You appreciate the cooks a lot more. You go to the movies, you appreciate the people handing you the tickets. You appreciate people at the grocery stores who had to work through all this stuff because you appreciate. I the- really appreciate the grocery store workers. Oh my god! And so many of them have caught the virus just while they're at work. You yeah. know, trying to make a put bread and uh, feed their families and take care of their families, and they have no choice. And not and, only, not only take care of their families. I'm sorry to cut you off, but they're taking care of us by being open for us to go out and get food. And I I really hope that people give these people more respect when they go because grocery. I mean, people look at you know you work in retail. They kind of you look down on. Not saying you, but just people look down at. They're like, oh, you work in retail, blah blah blah. But it's like now you really see how important these people are because if. If the food stops, like if, say, if you know the grocery stores closed down, if they were closed through all this stuff, what are we going to do? Start hunting again? <laughs> we're not made, we're not built for that anymore. We we evolved from that for the most part, so it's like we can't just go out and start hunting. Well, I don't know. I I don't know what the I, you know. I guess buy a lot of rot, keep a lot of rice around. I mean, you know, I do have friends that are stocking up on stuff like that just in case. Because it could get worse. It's it's much worse in California right now. The virus is uh, the highest it's been, and um, and sadly, uh, I went through a drive-through um, two days ago uh, because for my dog, my dog likes to pull your low cooked chicken, <laughs> and uh, so you know I went through a drive-through and. Um, the sweet young boy that handed me uh, the bag. Mm-hmm. And on a mask, but it was here, <laughs> you know, man, the mask has got to go here, you know, and, and, uh, don't think I didn't, uh, come home and wash everything down because, you know, people are very resentful of wearing a mask mm-hmm. and it's the one thing that's going to make help, not make it go away, but help make it go away. Yeah. And, um, and younger, he was young, and he and if he got it, he probably it probably wouldn't affect him so much. But anybody over fifty, mm-hmm. uh, even in their forties, uh, can be deeply affected by it if they have any underlying conditions or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people my age are, and a lot most actors are just staying isolated. They're just not going out. They're doing things like this and doing interviews like this. I mean, look at. Um, you know, all the talk show hosts, they're doing it from home. They're not doing it from the studios. But um, uh, to not wear a mask is so irresponsible, not only for yourself, but your children and your parents and your grandparents. It's just, it's such an easy thing to do. And uh, people are just refusing to do it. Even where I live, uh, Mm -hmm. I live near Malibu and um, uh, I will see people now in the stores they won't let you in unless you have one uh but just walking around still close by on the sidewalks and stuff you know people aren't people think that well it's just me i don't have any germs i don't have it well you don't know that and and you don't know that you're not a spreader and they're just not wearing they just refuse to wear a mask my neighbors they refuse to wear a mask well i always have on one because I just, I don't want to catch it. For one thing, I've had several friends die of this virus. Yeah, it's it's cra- it's really crazy. And the, the wild thing about it is it really shut the whole world down. It wasn't just like a United States thing. It wasn't just in China. Like, it's literally all around the world. It's not just... Well, I, you know, I, I yeah. And a lot of the world... I, I guess there are more cooperative citizens or something that are, are, they want it to go away. So they're putting on masks and gloves and doing the things they need to do. Believe me, after this virus, um, uh, say we get a, a cure for it right away, I'll still be in a mask and gloves if I go to the supermarket. Mm-hmm. I'm going to still wear one because we're, we're all vulnerable to the next virus. Yeah. After, if we get a handle on COVID-19, you think it's going to be the last one? Absolutely not. So I have to be, I have a little asthma sometimes. And so I have to be very careful. Yeah. Understandable. 
And I mean, this is, I will, I'll say this one thing. I know it's not a political podcast at all, but like we have, I think with us versus other countries, we have a leader who's taking the whole COVID-19 thing as like a joke. And then you have people who follow him take it as a joke because he's taking it as a joke. And then you have leaders around the world who are just like, look, we need to stop this. We need to shut this down. We need to wear gloves. We need to do what we're supposed to do to get rid of this. And you see a lot of places, the curve is just going way down and ours is climbing. Look at, I mean, just a few weeks ago, Florida. I mean, I know Florida is like the, the joke of the United States, but Florida, they didn't take it serious. And now all of a sudden the virus is going crazy in Florida. Well, sick. you know, the, the, his security, half of his security uh, team that was in Tulsa are all quarantined now because they've been exposed yeah. and, te and testing positive. So um, hopefully there will be a huge change and everybody will go vote in November. And... Um, we can uh, even tackle this with more uh, this issue, which is a, a very serious issue, both economically mm -hmm. and uh, health wise for our nation. And, and people will go out and vote and try to bring some sense back into how to fix all this. Um, and um, I pray to God that it goes in that direction. I'm with you on that. I will say some positives just because we were on, you know, kind of down slope. So I'll say with the, there are some positives about this whole thing. I'm not talking about people getting sick and passing away. I feel for them. I pray for them. But I mean, as far as like, for me, for example, and for others, like if you have a podcast and you're stuck at home, you can perfect your craft. You can work on your craft. And I feel if you're someone who writes scripts, if you're someone who wants to be in movies, you can you can work on your craft on your own. You can, I mean, if you want to record, do a movie, record either it's recording or acting with your household, just grab your cell phone and just practice some, write some lines and just practice. Have fun with it. And I say to put it, I say put it out there to the world as far as to YouTube and all that. Not only so you can see it, but so others can see it. And say you started back in March when this whole COVID thing started and you were consistent with it. And now by June 25th, you will learn so much in those three months, four months. Just just you watch, just you doing it. Even if you don't watch other YouTube videos, just you doing it and practicing and practicing and practicing. You'll get so much better. And I say put it out there so you can see your growth from day one to day, say, 70. And I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, A, well, the last two weeks I've been working on my taxes. but uh, So that's not really a learning process. That's just a tedious pain in my butt. <laughs> but um, the um, other thing is uh, I have been working on learning uh, French and Portuguese. Oh, that's awesome. and I've been writing on a book that I am writing about, uh, which is, uh, takes place in 1967. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very edgy and very dark. And, um, uh, and I've been writing a lot of music. So I do everything I can not to get bored. And uh, actually, there are not enough hours in the day to do all the things I want to do and finish in the daytime, you know? Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's great, though, that you're lear just learning a new language. Not just one, but for you too. Learning a new language is just, that's cool. That's really cool. And you're actually the second person that said that on this show. I had a gentleman on a few weeks ago and he said he was learning, um, oh, what was I want to say Mandarin. And he that's said, a good one to learn. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, a, uh, he's like an independent direct horror director and he wants to learn that so he can incorporate it into his movies. Not only that, but, you know, translate his movies into that as far as subtitles and vice versa. So I said, that's, that's really, really freaking cool. That's not an easy language to learn either. That's so, what I heard. It's not French, easy to learn easy. But, Portuguese is not easy, but French is much easier. Yeah. Yeah, Portu Portuguese, I don't know it, but I'm like, I, I watch fighting, like MMA, UFC and stuff. So you see all fighters from all around the world, and you see them, the Portuguese speaking Portuguese, and the Brazilian speaking the Portuguese, and it's, it's, I know it's very similar to Spanish, but still way different. So there's like some words that are the same or similar. I'll pick up stuff here and there and then have no idea what they said for the rest. <laughs> have no idea what they said for the rest of the thing. But yes, that's, that's awesome. Go yeah, it, it, I mean, you do have to look at the bright side of it. And, um, um, and I, I, uh, I have family, but they don't live with me. So, um, uh, it's an adjustment because he, all these years, even around the time I was doing the Hills Have Eyes, uh, I always had tons of people in my home and 
it was always a party almost every night, people going in and coming out. My, my husband was a, a very big in the music business and a composer and a rock star. And I, I, his name was Delaney Bramlett. He's now passed away. And uh, we just always had so many people in our home. And um, it's been a huge adjustment for me to go from uh, this amazing group of family and friends mm -hmm. to being alone. So I've had a really, um, I, I really struggle to make sure that I take a look at it and realize I'm not the only one going through this. And um, a friend of mine uh, duh, this week couldn't take it anymore and ended his life. And, um, um, and um, suicide is on the rise. So, you know, I think you have to talk yourself down off, off the ledge in terms of realizing that everybody's going through the same thing. And, and hopefully this is just temporary. And maybe it's not. I mean, it could be. It's possible that uh, this could be uh, longer than we any of us anticipate. Nobody knows. Yeah, you're so right with that. You're so right with that. I just feel it's one of those things where we just got to – a lot of people just got to take it a lot more serious. And I know some people think that it won't affect them, but it's like, well, what about this person here next to you? What about this person over here? What about your child, like you were saying, or your parents or your grandparents or – what about someone else? What about somebody else's child or someone else's grandparents? If it's not going to affect you and your family, there's all there's people all over this, all over the place can affect. Well, today on the news, you know, some young people are getting it more than mm -hmm. even older people now. They may not die from it, but they're getting it, and 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 it's no walk in the park. A lot of them are having to be intubated and having strokes from it, and we don't know what it does with the body. So it, I find it to be like a horror. Uh, <laughs> you know, a horror disease, it kind of goes, eats you up, you know, or whatever. It's very dangerous. It really is. It really is. And I'll be so glad when it's all over with and things, I don't want to say get back to normal. I'll say when things, if things get better than normal. But I guess we'll see. We'll see. As better, than, better than normal is a really good thing to say. I'm disappointed. That, that's the first time I've heard that. Now I'm, I'm going to go with that one. I'm, I may steal that. Oh, well, be my guest. Go right ahead. I just say that because I, I hope people come out. We all come out as better people when, once this is all said and done. Come out as better people. Treat not only yourself better, but others better. If you like them or not, you don't have to be a jerk to them. Just don't associate with them. Simple. I mean, simple as that with certain things. But treat each other better, and that's how this world will become a better place. I kind of feel like, in a sense, the world's punishing us. It's like, all right, you guys have been treating each other, not only treating each other, but treating the world like garbage for years. So I'm going to show you. Because <laughs> today, say if I look at it like today, if the world quote unquote ended, kind of how like with the dinosaur, the world's still going to be here, just resetting itself like it always does. We're, you know, we'll be gone, but the world will still reset itself. And then whatever else comes after humans will be here and the world will keep going and going and going. So, I mean, just take better care of each other, the world and yourselves. And yeah, be I think, I think, um, I think that maybe uh, people have forgotten how to love each other as mm -hmm. as human beings, and I think uh, that without love, you really have this empty kind of world, and um, uh, there's just so much uh, negativity right now, and greed, and personal greed, and and stuff like that, and. Um, it's just maybe maybe the world has decided to reset itself. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, nobody knows. But, you know, what the world needs now is love. I don't know. It's, you know, we need to love each other more. We definitely do. And I feel social media can be good and bad. It can be good because you see, I mean, we're doing this because of social media. But then it's bad because all the negativity that's shared and spread and people feel free. Right? They feel they can say anything to anybody because you're behind your desk or behind your computer. And there's no repercussions, which one thing I am very, very happy about now is that I tell people all the time is now, like when you see as far as like a racist thing on the internet and people are like, oh, we should, you know, you want to go beat that person up or whatever. I mean, no, we're past that now. Share it and let their, let their job see this. Let their businesses see this. So that way, the worst you can hurt people like that is hurt them in their pocket. Hurt, hurt their pocket. Don't, Violence isn't going to solve it. Violence is not going to help. 
But you, for you hurt these people's pockets to where they're losing their jobs or if they have a business and people are like, you know what, I'm not shopping at this business anymore because of the way they think about other people just because of the color of their skin or their religion or whatever the case may be. I'm not give, I'm not going to spend my hard-earned money there. I'll spend it at this place across the street. It might cost $10 more for me to get the same item, but guess what? I'm not supporting that type of person. And that's just the best way to do it. See, I think everybody should have to do 23 and Me because – I don't see anybody being pure or anything. You know, uh, I personally uh, discovered that my great, great, great grandmother was a slave from West Africa. Now, I'm a little bit lighter than even maybe the lightest people you can think about. I mean, I'm very fair. Uh, but I had a very, uh, I had a lot of cousins that are certainly mixed and um and um i'm so proud of that and uh you know that that we're not all what we think we are mm -hmm. and i think if everybody could see i i can clearly see that i mean you appear to be very mixed to me i'm mixed and you i don't appear to be mixed but i am mixed mm -hmm. and my nieces and nephews are mixed and why hate anybody else? You know, it's it, we're all from this. The, the, we're all human beings from the same source or the the same initial source of life. And so, uh, for anybody to be a racist uh, to me is just ridiculous. You know, it, it, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's relearning. But if you look at your DNA. Yeah. They said 20% of some of those Southern Bubba's down there are, are not pure white. <laughs> so I'm really happy about that. And I have gotten so tight with my cousins. I've done two Kwanzas in a row now. <laughs> you know, you know what'd be real funny about that too? Is just imagine people like that that were racist, like say the race they hate the most is the race that they were. And they were just like, Oh man, like that's, that's the people I hate so much. And you're hating yourself by doing yeah. it. Basically. Yeah. And yeah. I'm glad that you pointed out me being mixed because I am. My father's from North Carolina. He's 76 years old, so of course he's seen a lot of stuff from then. But he's he's African American, and then on my mom's side, she's mixed. My grandmother was, I believe, German and Irish, mm -hmm. and then my grandfather on that side was Blackfoot Indian and African American as well, and whatever else we were mixed with before then. So. Just the, and the way I was raised was to you know treat people the way you want to be treated. I really feel, <clears throat> me personally, I feel like if you're treating or not treating, sorry, if you're raising your children to hate or be racist and all that, that should be considered child abuse. That should be considered a crime because you should not teach your child child to hate. You should not teach your child to hate because oh this person's a different color, so you shouldn't like them. Because if you get children in a room, like say three year olds, four year olds in a room together, you put a ball in there. The only thing they're going to be arguing about is who has the ball, if anything. They're going to be in there playing for the most part. But they're not going to keep, oh, I'm not going to play with him because he's a different color. They don't care about that. And as soon as you teach them that, because they don't see color, like, I know people say I don't see color, but children really don't see color like that until they're taught it. The only thing a, a child may ask is, why are we two different colors? But that's not, they just don't know. They don't know any better. They don't know. And that's just, hey, it's just the way we were made. Simple as that. It's just, it's just how it is. Simple as that. And I, I think appreciation for for uh, the gifts of what you have in your DNA, mm -hmm. depending on who you are. I, I don't like the term colorblind because I don't think anybody really is. I think that we do see the physical differences and how I have longed for more melanin in my skin because I burn so fast and I don't like, uh, I prefer, particularly like a sort of a tan, lovely, smooth, you know, whatever. I mean, we all have things we like or don't like about ourselves. And, um, you know, I have such an appreciation for uh, some of the talents that, that um, Africa and Africans have in their DNA that maybe some of the Europeans uh, lack. And so I think to say that we can't appreciate you know, uh, because we, we're not all the same people, but to love and appreciate what comes along with who we are mm -hmm. is, is a major. I, I, uh, I can clearly, I'm not colorblind in terms of seeing that somebody is 
a different color than I am are uh, they may have a prettier skin tone than I do and maybe they want my blonde hair I don't know I straighten it but you know, in my DNA said on my 23 me you definitely do not have straight hair and I don't and they got that right <laughs> you know yeah. but uh, but you know just appreciate each other for the gifts and love those differences instead of uh, finding it to be a negative, you know. I'm with you. Or a superior, nobody's superior. Not at you know, all. we're all in it together. And um, there's so much talent on each side of the fence. So, you know, I, I treasure somebody's intelligence, their compassion, uh, their uh, uh, gifts, their talent. Mm -hmm. And those are the things, and, and, those are the things that I treasure in another human being. I don't care what color they are. If they have been, they, we can carry on a great conversation and, and um, there's a, I, I've always been attracted. My husband was very talented and I, I've always been attracted to men that have talent or are great intellect. That, that is much more important to me than looks. Mm -hmm. Even though he had both. It was really cute, but uh, um, anyway, that's my thing. No, I, I agree with you there, though. You could you, I mean, as far as the physical attraction with people, you do have to have that physical attraction. But as far as like for me, I can see the most beautiful woman in the world, but her attitude, her personality can just ruin it. <laughs> just ruin it. You'd be exactly. nasty. And it's like, okay, you're really not as attractive as you think you are. And you just kind of, you know, you leave those situations, but it's just. I don't know. I really hope people from this, all this stuff that's going on between that and then the movement that's going on, I hope people really do come out better and treat each other a lot better. That's the only way we're all going to heal. And I have such hope in the youth right now, the, the, the kids that are out there trying to make this statement about all of the above and that um, it's not, not acceptable to um, uh, abuse anybody just mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm so proud of the young people right now that are out there. And um, I've gone to one of the protests, um, um, and I certainly went to the million women, you know, the women's pink hat march uh, in L.A. when that happened. Uh, but I've been marching uh, for civil rights and um, women's equality um, since um, the 60s. So that's a long time of my old ass being on the street. Uh, with a sign and so uh, we have made some great leeways uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of areas but um, the last three years we've lost a lot of that momentum that we I have agree that. I and do I do feel with this whole pandemic like a lot of stuff that's been going on people actually have to stop and pay attention to it because usually if you're you know say you're working and all this stuff I'm not saying you don't hear about it but you're not really focused on it as much because you're like, I have other things going on. And that's not to say that it's not important. But now that you're stu everybody's stuck at home, it's like, I can't keep ignoring this. I can't just keep putting a blind eye to it. Some, a lot of people still do. A lot of people still like, it's, oh, well, what did he do? Or what, you know what I mean? As far as that goes. But it's just like a lot of things are really being seen and thrown out in the open. And I really do feel it's going to be a change. My father even said the same thing as far as like, the protests and all that. He said it's never been this big, of course, because now it was in all 50 states. And not only that, but it's all over the world. And he was saying how it's never been this big. And just he does feel there's going to be changes coming. It might not be now, but within the next few years, it's going to take time, of course. And the youth is doing a great, great job with it for the most part. I mean, I like I hate how, you know, you're watching the news or something and all they talk about is like the riots and the looting, but they don't talk about there's people that are there that, yes, they're taking advantage of the situation, but there's also people that are there that not only are taking advantage of the situation, all they're doing is trying to cause ruckus, and then they're disappearing when the cameras come. But then you have a whole lot more people that are there peacefully. They do everything peacefully, and then they go about their business, and they go to the next place and do it peacefully. And, you know, it's all peaceful, but you want to just, you know, some people just want to focus on the, the negativity around it. I'm like, that's really not helping anything. If you focus on the positive of what's going on, and try to help with the positive and stand with the people for the positive, a lot of this stuff would be, you know, it's going to, you help the ball get rolling more. Definitely. Definitely. And it's, it's, I kind of find it funny now how, as far as 
Kaepernick for you a few years ago taking a knee. Now the NFL is standing with him with that, and now people are like, some people are still always oh, disrespectful, but those same people, those same people that say disrespecting the flag are the same people that wear a hat with a flag on it, or a shirt, or a bathing suit, and I get whatever it is with the articles with the flag, making money off the flag. You're not supposed to do any of those things. It does not say anything about taking a knee for the flag. That's not disrespectful. But all the other stuff, wearing it, having the flags hanging off your truck with your, you know, the smoke and all that going all over the flag. Supposed to be just hanging, hanging up. If you have a flag, supposed to be just flying high. That's it. None of the other stuff you're doing. Not for the Fourth of July and your fireworks and your shirts and your napkins where you're wiping your dirty mouth. But they don't see that. <laughs> they just see a man taking a knee, trying to make a stand. And instead of saying, "Okay, well, why is he protesting this?" It's he shouldn't be doing it there. He shouldn't be taking a knee at the flag. And I've had people come at me saying, "Because I'm a 49ers fan," I've had coworkers, "Hey, he's disrespecting. Like how? Tell me how? Because he's taking it." Oh, Okay, but and then the next thing will be well, I had family in the military. I'm like, okay, so you're saying African Americans didn't fight in the military, especially back then when your great great grandparents or your grandparents go home, they're considered heroes. My great grandparents go home and they're still considered nothing. They're still considered dirt. They're still considered slaves. But they fought for this same country for your freedom. And you come back to this and you want me to stand for something that doesn't stand. Like what the st- what the flag stands for is beautiful, but it's like you want me to stand for something that's not really standing for me. Exactly. Exactly. I I, I agree with you. I mean, I, he should never have been fired for that. You know, he was and making I, his own yeah. personal statement, and he, and he had a right to do that. And doing it peacefully, and like what what it is with people with protests, I don't think they understand. Protests are not supposed to be comfortable. They're not supposed to be like, oh well, you know you know what, can you do it? Can you guys do it at six o'clock? Cause you know, I'll be home from work and can you do it like down the street quietly? So I don't have to hear it and I don't have to be bothered. It's like, that, that's not how it works. That's if it, that's how it works and how things got into motion. Then things would have been changed years ago. That's not how things work. It's not done. Pe- I mean, it's done peacefully for the most part, but it's not done to make you feel comfortable. If it was, then you just ignore it. Like you do anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yep, pretty but, much. Again, I'm glad that things are starting to change little by little. Like as far as these police officers that are actually getting a trial, let's hope they all get convicted. But that's it's sad that it took this long because this should have been years ago. If you killed somebody, there should be no reason why you shouldn't be getting locked up and all this other stuff. But at least it's getting to that, and let's see where it goes next. And you know what I tell people uh, uh, when I been on Twitter or something and I've seen, well, uh, he had a criminal record and, and, uh, whatever, you know, listen, when the police arrived, uh, arrested mm-hmm. Jeffrey Dahmer, he had eaten people. Mm-hmm. George Floyd passed a bad $20 bill. If he did mm-hmm. a $20 bill, he didn't eat nobody. You know what I mean? Yep. And they, they carefully and whatever arrested Jeffrey Dahmer with, you know, they didn't put their knee in his neck. If anybody needed to be executed on the spot, it was him, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and so if anybody wants to debate the difference of how people are being treated, I think that is the, you know, a, a good example of, you know, how different people are arrested in this yeah. country. I mean, that's what needs to change. You can even go more recent with the, um, the Dylan roof, the kid that he went to church, prayed with the people, prayed with him there. And then he killed nine people. And not only did he get arrested, there was no bruises, no nothing. They put a bulletproof vest on him and took him to Burger King to get something to eat and drink. Like, that's not right. I don't like stuff like that. I feel, and I'm like, if I, if you're a police officer and you know, somebody has harmed somebody, I'm not mad. If you rough a person up, I'm not mad at that. If you know, somebody murdered somebody, murdered a bunch of innocent people. I, I don't care what color they are. I'm not saying you should do that. But at the same time, don't sit here and somebody murdered somebody and you just, oh, yeah, you know, let's, let's put, put this bulletproof vest on him. Let's take him out of here peacefully. Let's put him in the car and let's go get him something to eat. But then there's a man, you put handcuffs on him, you make him lay on the ground, you put your knee on his neck, and he didn't, he didn't do anything. Maybe a counterfeit 20, and that's a maybe. We don't even know the facts about that. It's just like, and it happens too much. You have the guy... Selling cigarettes a few years ago, selling Lucy's, you put him in a chokehold. It's just, it's just sad. It's, it's, so it's. Here's the other thing about that twenty dollar bill. 
you know, if I have a hundred dollar bill and I go to the seven 11 and I buy a Coke or whatever, mm -hmm. and they give me change, I don't look at every bill to make sure that that bill is a good bill or whatever. How easy is it for any of us to spend a $20 bill that could have been tampered with of some sort? I don't look at my change, you know, um, that is just bull, you know, I mean, that, that, uh, that was, that didn't even make sense to me. Not at all. I mean, where did he get it? He didn't make a $20, yeah. $20 counterfeit bill probably. I mean, I, I can't imagine that he did. Mm -hmm. He just spent $20. So, um, I mean, I, I, I wasn't there. I don't know, yeah. but I've never seen anything as horrific as that murder. And, and he was murdered. He definitely was. But again, it's, it's sad that somebody has to be like a sacrifice, so to speak, before people start to really open their eyes. But again, going back to what we were saying about the youth, the youth is beautiful because it's, it's not just black and white. It's every single race is out there at these marches. It's every single race that's fighting. It's every single race that's really, really, really getting fed up. And I was just talking to my father about this yesterday. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, as far as, you know, people using the N-word. I'll say, you know what I'm liking about this nowadays, Dad? I said, white people are getting way more upset about it and ready to fight more than we are. I said, it's sad to say this because you're kind of used to hearing it here and there. But I said, they get really, like, I'm, I'm going to go kick, you know, I'm going to go kick this person's ass. And I'm just like, look, that's not the way we're handling it now. Let's, if you're going to do it, let them lose their business. Let them lose their money because that's going to hurt them way worse than you beating them up. They're only going to be hurting for, say, 30 seconds, 10 minutes from getting beat up. But when their pockets hurt, then they're going to, okay, you know what, maybe some of them, maybe I need to open my eyes. And I've even seen, which I've, I'm really loving a lot online, is there's people who had, like, racist tattoos that they got, say, at a young age. And through all this stuff, they're just saying, you know what, this was stupid to get. And some tattoo shops are covering them for free. Oh, and that's cool. They're just like, you know what, I was wrong. I apologize. It's that in a third. And it's never too late to change. That's one thing I will say when it comes to especially stuff like that. It's never too late to change. And... I'm an accepting person. I understand people have a history, people have a past, but I'm not going to judge you on your past, but if you continue to do that, that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing. But I mean, if you're young and dumb, everybody's been young and dumb and done stupid. We've all have, not, not necessarily with race, but just in general. Young, dumb things, we've all done it. Some things you might regret if it was really bad. Some things are just like, why the hell did I even do that? And you learn from it, you grow from it, and you move on from it. My last um, live show was February 29th with Cleo King um, and a group of us flew from Los Angeles to St. Louis, Missouri, where she's from. And she had put together this show about um, different uh, W.E. Du Bois and uh, a lot of people say W.E. Du Bois, uh, Harriet Tubman and um, then one of the, uh, my relatives, uh, Walter Francis White, who was the president of the NAACP for many, many years. And for almost 25 years, my relative was the president of the NAACP. And um, uh, he was very light and, and, and he was able to uh, become friends with um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt mm -hmm. to push through um, public equality in terms of schooling and housing reform and uh, worked very hard to try to get lynching made illegal, which they can't even get that passed now, which seems rather um, absurd to me. But um, at any rate, um, I was a little nervous because COVID had started in the country uh, and we went ahead and went to St. Louis and did the show. And, um, uh, you know, to, to educate people, it's very important. And um, so, uh, at any rate, um, I'm really glad I did the show because in all of our, in, in all of the environment, I was, I was, uh, uh, I kind of stood out like a sore thumb. Uh, the whole cast was black, and 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 I was with them, and uh, I had the best time. And you know, the the it's such a beautiful culture, and um, I'm so glad that everybody's beginning to appreciate everybody's culture. You know, I've always loved Asian food the best. You know, I think the Asians have that food thing going. You know. Yeah, and it, that that's just a beautiful thing, though, and I I want to thank you for that.
for not only being an ally, but being like in the front lines, because I feel we need more people like yourself to do that because more people will listen, which is, it's crazy as it sounds. It's like, oh, well, not again, not with everybody. It's like, oh, okay, well, they have, they have white people with them. So maybe they're not lying about this stuff. Maybe there's racist because there's some people who still think racism isn't real or that people are exaggerating. You know, you know, there's people like that. But with people like yourselves, heroes like yourself, it's just like, okay, we really need to listen now, which I respect that. I love that because not only do you, not only do I can, I can tell that you use your voice, but you also listen to the people who are in hurt or like, okay, I want to understand this. So what's going on? I want to, I'm going to close my mouth. I always say to people, I got this from my mother because she used to yell at me all the time to run in my mouth. God gave you two eyes, two ears and one mouth for a reason. And I feel people use their mouth way more than they use their ears and their eyes. And it's just, it's just that time for people to just shut up and listen. And then also for the people who have that platform or who know what they're talking about to use their voice. And that goes to any race. Cause I don't feel just, I, I don't feel just black people can speak on racism and make it be heard. I feel it can come from anybody. And sometimes you need to come from other people for other people to listen. Sometimes you need other people that look like you for people to look like you to listen. Same with me. People like me, I could be like, listen, there's amazing white people. You guys need to listen to them. You guys need to stand up for them just like they're standing up for us. You know what I mean? Like you, you need the people that look like you because it's, they just understand it or they maybe trust it more, which I get. I understand that. Yeah. I, I had a couple of uh, young black girls cause I told my own story um, that came up and cried in my arms because of my, my story. Um, um, but it, it was very rewarding for me to be able to participate and uh, an honor to be asked to do so. Um, but I, I know when um, Stacey Abrams was having problems with the count initially several years ago, I, uh, I know that her part of her legal uh, defense was being sponsored by the NAACP so uh, I immediately became a member and have kept up my membership with the NAACP. I think it's important that uh, people's rights and um, we, we must uh, be accountable for, for the election. And, and I think that organizations that have been around as long as the NAACP has will uh, have a better chance of policing the uh, real outcome of, of uh, the election. So... Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm a proud member of that. And I think, I think that, and I've also contributed to, to Jamie Harrison's campaign uh, and Stacey's and Kamala, Kamala's <laughs> and, and Elizabeth's. I mean, you know, I think that we have to kind of help those who, uh, you know, participate financially as well as uh, physically in what we say. We have to do stuff to, to make it happen. I agree. I agree. And, educating people we have to try to educate it, it's tough there's some people that i have cut off because they just don't want to listen it's more about like all they care about is the economy so i'm like okay well if you don't really care about people over the economy then i, I really don't want to deal with you i try to explain it and you keep throwing the same arguments and it's like i'm just done i'm not going to get angry like I'm, I'm done getting angry and lashing out and all that stuff because it, it really does nothing all it does gets gets my blood boiling for the day and i'm like it's it's not yeah, it hurts us it's not worth it. And I like, I love my friends I have on as far as like with these arguments, if I have them on Facebook or not, cause they, they'll just jump right in there like quick. And this is my, my white friends. They'll just jump right in there. Like, look, all they I've said it, to, I've said it before. And they're saying, they're saying what people are asking for is equality. Be happy that they don't want revenge. They just want equality. How hard is it to treat people equal, treat people right, treat people the way you want to be treated, treat people the way you want people to treat your children. How hard is that? It, totally. I mean, exactly. I, I, I just, yeah, I, I've really made an effort not, not to let the anger win uh, with when I see something so unfair. And I have um, close friends that say, well, the economy, I go, you know, without uh, equality, the economy is going to fail eventually anyway, because um, it is not, in a few years, it's not going to be primarily, uh, um, white people won't be the uh, majority. And so uh, you better keep that in mind. 
because, uh, you know, I'm kind of old. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime, uh, but the next generation it will. And, and, and um, you better be careful whose feet you step on because, you know, it could end up the other way around. You yeah. know? And my, my only thing, like I said, my thing is just treat people they want to be treated and simple as that, no matter what color they are, treat people the way you want to be treated, treat people the way you would want your children to be treated, treat them right. If the person's a jerk, no matter what color they are, just get them out of your life. Don't deal with that person. If the person's nice, be nice. It's you know, sadly, in the in the uh, 70s or late 60s and 70s, there was so much, uh, I mean, because you guys weren't around then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think anybody's really aware of how much our society had integrated. And um, it was nothing to have your black friends over for dinner and your white friends and you didn't really care what color and and uh, and we'd go to the same parties and the same nightclubs and the, I mean it was much more integrated than it seems to have gotten in the 80s and definitely lately but um, I, it's important that we are social with each other yeah it's it, it's very important that we're because that's how we um, really learn to appreciate each other as people is to also be social with each other, not just on an internet. Um, and, and not from, I mean, you know, I, and, and it can be so much fun. So, I mean, um, the, so I, I don't know. I just think that everybody's missing out. If you, if you don't, um, you know, be social with each other as well and love each other. Yeah. And it's it's really one of the easiest things in the world to do. Like I feel like, as far as hating, hating takes up way too much energy. And oh yeah. Because I I've, I don't there's people I don't like, which is fine. But hating I don't hate anybody anymore because it just it just, it's just it takes up that it takes up your energy. Like it, it gets to the point to say if you see that person that you hate, your blood just starts boiling. You don't even have to be interacting with each other. You can be in a store. You can be wherever and just and I just I'm glad I'm over that kind of stuff. Like I just. It's just, it's, like I said, it's wasted energy. It's, it's unhealthy. And nine times out of, well, I won't say nine times out of ten, but a lot of times you make a stupid or a bad decision because you hate versus if you just don't, you cannot like somebody, not agree, and just walk away. Uh, there are a lot of people I don't like. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people oh, yeah. I don't like. But I don't, it's, that's not based on what color they are. That's based on how they've treated me, the things they've said to me, mm -hmm. and our interaction. Or maybe I don't even think that person is somebody – that I have all that much in common with, but yeah. it's not based on what I'm, race they are. Not at all, because there's there's people there's black people I cannot stand. <laughs> there's white people I can't. Yeah. It's all over. It's like as far as that goes, it's whatever racial. I don't care if you treated me or my family member that way. I don't want to deal with you. Simple exactly. as that. Exactly. And it has nothing to do with your race at all. <laughs> me but too. It, it's. It, I think it will as it will eventually get better. Maybe not even in my lifetime, but maybe down the line. Hopefully, down the line, it'll get better. No, it's going to get better in your lifetime. Believe me, it'll I be better. It's going to be better in your lifetime. I promise. I hope so. I yeah. I, I do. It have, will not in mine, but it will be in yours. You, you can know. be my son. You get. You're old enough to be my son. So no, it will be in yours. <laughs> you never. I mean, hopefully, hopefully, it's. There, you know what I miss though is like sports. Sports, sports is one of those things where, for the most part, people don't care what color you are, your background. It's just you're who's on the best player, who's the most talented. You know, and like, like when you're on a team, it's like that team was like a brotherhood right there or a sisterhood, and it's like we have we have each other's backs. We go out on this field, we have each other's backs no matter what happens. And even a lot of most players, be, you know, they become good friends off the field or off the courts. And it's like we have each other's backs out on the outside, not just here on this field. And I think that's a, I think it's one thing that right now with this whole COVID thing, like your basketball, baseball, football, it's not going on. And the good thing about it, I guess, is you're watching, you're, again, you're paying attention to all this other stuff, so it's not a distraction. But the bad thing about it is because sports bring people together, like music. Music brings people together. Sports bring music yeah. to bring people together. Food brings people together, probably more than anything in this world. Food brings people together and why can't we argue about that like who makes the best food why can't that be the issue not being racist but like hey look 
I feel like this is the best order. This is the best. Let, let's let something like that be the issue. Not going to violence. Like, hey, you need to try this. This is amazing food. It's better than this over here or whatever the case may be. Not, you know, I'm not going to hang out with this guy because he's black or hang out with this guy because he's white. That's that's stupid. Well, you miss out on so much. You miss out on meeting some amazing people because you're so blind to the fact of what color somebody is or oh, what yeah. the background is. I've met so many people, all different races, all different religions, and that doesn't even come up as a topic. That doesn't even become an issue. We might we might joke amongst friends about it, but just like jokes, which I see nothing wrong with it, but I feel like it's if your friends or family, you know, joking around, cool, whatever. Especially with guys, we like to bust each other's shops all the time. But when it comes to the point of where you're being hateful, that's just I don't I really don't understand it. I don't want to understand it. Yeah. So you love horror, huh? Oh yes. I love horror. Like it's What's just your favorite horror movie. My favorite horror movie? <laughs> That's a tough one. I don't really have... I, I do. No, I do really enjoy this movie. I, I'll say this. My favorite era is probably the 70s and the 80s. Just because the way the movies were made, the practical effects that were used in these movies, I love that. I think that's way better than the CGI stuff. I understand why they have to use it nowadays, but it just takes a lot out of the movies. Yeah. And it's, it's just fun. I, like like I said, I've been watching them since I was a kid, and now I do a podcast for it. My wife is a big horror fan as well, which makes it so much. It makes it easier. So like when I go to these times and she comes, she's not being dragged along, and I get to meet awesome people like yourself. Like I get to I get the pleasure of having you on my podcast for an interview and just meet a bunch of horror fans all over the world, and it's great. It's one of those places where I feel. Nobody's judged. Like I've been to, I've been to cons. I'll give you a quick example. This last con I went to in October, my brother and I were in a bunch of panels, and there was one panel that we were on that only two people showed up for, and they're a part of the LGBTQ community. Mm-hmm. And I, I had to run out for something. I ran like I don't know if I went to the bathroom, but I came back, and they were sitting down in chairs. My brother was standing there. They were just talking, so I just pulled up a chair. My brother pulled up a chair, and for that time, that hour that was supposed to be the panel we just sat and just talked just talked horror and just talked just anything just had a nice conversation when it was all said and done because i think somebody needed the room after got up and they just they just said thank you guys so much for taking the time just to sit with us and just talk just something simple like that and horror i give horror the credit because horror is what brought us there horror is the reason why we're at this time horror is the reason why we're at this panel but then just being a decent human being, just sitting down, because we could have just went and walked around the con or did whatever, went to our room, but we're like, no, let's just sit down, have a nice conversation. The same with them. They sat down and just had a conversation with us. It was a great time, great conversation, and everybody thanked each other through the whole weekend. Like, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm, glad, I could, I'm glad I could do something like that to put a smile on someone's face. I think that's another reason why, more so now, why I have this podcast still, why I keep doing it, is because it's not, not only because I love horror, because that's, it's my favorite genre, hands down. But I'm meet, meeting people, and then I feel like the conversation we had, people will sit down and listen to this episode, and they'll just, it'll make them think. And other conversations I have on podcasts or when I'm joking around a lot with other people, it'll make them smile. So if you're having a bad day, you can listen to this show and put a smile on your face, get you out of that, you know, out of that zone for a couple hours or however long, however many episodes you listen to, get you out of that zone, get you out of that funk for a little while, just kind of a getaway. And that's what horror does for me at the same time with all the craziness going on in this world. I can throw on a horror movie. And I know there's craziness in the horror movies, but it's still just like a getaway and just as crazy as it sounds, relaxing. It's like, this is great. Yes, beat that jerk up, cut his head off, but this is just great and relaxing. And you get back to the real world. And it's just like When I was a little girl, I loved horror movies, mm-hmm. but there was no internet and you didn't watch them on television. You'd have to go to the actual big screen theater. And um, uh, when I was a little girl, they were, you know, really young. I saw the Pit and the Pendulum and, mm-hmm. and some of the Vincent Price horror movies. And I just found them to be fascinating. And I, I loved to, to go to the theater. And that was really scary. I mean, they were, they were pretty scary back then. Um, what was the scariest one? Uh, invaders from Mars. Oh my gosh, that was so scary when I was a, a kid, and yeah. it, it did keep me awake and everything. But you could see them in the big screen, and it was. Um, I hope that uh, movie theaters um, make it through this uh, pandemic. I know AMC has uh, is closing 
a lot of theaters and I don't know if they're closing all of them. Um, so the, the experience of watching them on the big screen is different than watching them at home. Oh, I, 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 I'm friends with a director named Brian Danley who directed um, and created the, the movie with uh, Macaulay Culkin called Saved. And so um, often on Sundays we get a group and through uh, Netflix um, group watch or whatever, I can't remember the name of it, um, then we'll sit there and get a really bad B horror movie and watch it together and chat through it. And it's so much fun. So uh, that's, that's awesome. one way of, of, of watching them together when you're not in the same room, you know, with your friends and stuff. So I, I might as, we, we still haven't talked about this movie. We had, a, we had an amazing conversation though so far. The Hills Have Eyes. Now, how was it just being on set and everything? Just It was uncomfortable. Was First of all, it was low budget. And mm -hmm. I've been used to doing high budget TV shows, comedies, mostly sitcom. Mm -hmm. And so I was offered the role of Brenda in The Hills Have Eyes. Um, we were out in the desert in Victorville, California. And it was hot, hot, hot in the daytime. And it was freezing cold at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it was so low budget, I mean, everybody, we did have a makeup artist, but basically we were pretty much responsible for our own and uh, certainly the touch ups and things like that. Um, and so it was pretty primitive and, uh, but it was a lot of fun. And we, we all just approached it as one big kind of happy family. And uh, there was a little bit of dissension, but you know, um, uh, it was uh, a very uncomfortable, but a lot of fun. Okay. Then now, as far as the movie, the way the movie turned out, did it turn out better than you thought it would, or was it worse than you yeah. thought it would be? I never thought. I, I never thought anything would happen to it. I I was shocked it was released. I, except that they asked me to go on the tour to promote it mm -hmm. nationwide, and so I went with Wes and Peter Law to promote the movie in 1977 or a, I, I'm not sure we made it in 77. So I guess we began to premiere it in, um, the, in 77 or 78. And so, um, uh, it was well received, but not, but it, it seemed like it really just built momentum through the years. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and became a cult classic. A few years after it was released, I, I would say maybe 10 years after it was released, eight, uh, the Museum of Modern Art put it on permanent collection as the greatest terror classic ever made. And I, it wasn't considered a horror movie that back then. It was considered a terror movie back then, even though, of course, it was horror. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, that gave it a boost of respectability, I believe. And um, so it was, uh, I never in my wildest dreams thought that it would ever become iconic. Um, my girlfriend was in a bar in Manhattan a few weeks before the pandemic, and she sent me on the menu was a cocktail called The Hills Have Eyes. So <laughs> like it just never stops. That's awesome. The gift that keeps on giving. Yes. Yeah, that, that's cool, though. I mean, in this movie, that def did definitely turn into a cult classic. Like, I feel just about every horror fan, for the most part, has watched this movie and is, uh, has enjoyed this movie like I did myself. And it's, I want to thank you for the movie, for one thing. So thank you for the movie. Well, thank you for watching it. And I have to thank Wes Craven for casting me in it. <laughs> but I want to thank you because, I like, I look at it, I know I've talked to a lot of people and they'll say, you know, we want to thank the fans if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be where we're at. If it wasn't for you guys making these awesome movies, we wouldn't be where we're at either as far as getting to getting to watch stuff like The Hills Have Eyes. And I love it. I just feel, again, horror brings people together. <laughs> as crazy as it may sound, horror really, really brings people together. And like people are all scared of the same things. I mean, you know, we, we uh, it, it's, um, uh, it, it's fun to be scared and it's also fun to know that it's not really happening, that it's on the screen. And um, uh, my favorite horror movies, there is always an element 
of this isn't really, really happening. There's a comedic aspect to it or a surprise aspect to it. I love the movie Get Out. Um, I, I just thought it was brilliant the way that was made. It contained also humor and surprise. I, I have um, done a, a lot of horror movies. Uh, before the um, pandemic, I, was, uh, I did a, a new movie that has not been released yet called Inverted, and I play a Charles Manson 70s cult figure with all this hair and blood and evil, and, and you know, I get killed, and it was so much fun. Um, Tristan Clay directed it and um, um, so you know I'm still doing them I did one with Eric Roberts called No Solicitors not long ago and so um, but I also I uh, have two comedies coming out so uh, I'm excited about those so it's just a blessing to be able to keep working that's awesome that's that's great I love that you said you're do still doing horror and you're doing your comedy still which I know you have the passion for I just think it's I have a music video out uh, under my name, Suze Lanier Bramlett, on YouTube called Watch What You Asked For. Uh, it's a song that I wrote and composed and sing. And it's a music video with Michael Behrman, um, Pluto from The Hills Have Eyes, and, um, and Brooke Lewis, who plays, who's known as Miss Vampy. And um, uh, it's the three of us doing it. And I hope you're... Um, your audience will take the time to go to YouTube, Susan Lanier Bramlett, watch what you ask for, and check out that music video. It's funny. It's very funny. And it's also very horror. It's very bloody. So check it out. You definitely will. Definitely will. What I'll do is once I put this episode out, because it will be on YouTube as well, I can connect it so it'll have like your, ch your channel to check out and watch it so people can go to your channel. Okay. And they can see the video. <clears throat> but I'll, I'll make sure I do that. I have another um, video, a music video out called Facebook of a song that I co-wrote. And um, it's, a, it's a farce on, on actual Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, quite funny. So I like to do everything with a little bit of comedy attached to it. I think there were funny moments actually in The Hills Have Eyes. And light moments. You've got to have the lightness balance the gore and if a horror movie doesn't have that then i think it's a very badly made and badly written movie yeah a, a lot of horror movies do have like really light humor here and there and then i also feel horror fans like if you're a horror fan watching a horror movie we find things that maybe most people that aren't horror fans won't find funny in a horror movie so that you, there's also that thing too but i do i do agree like i i do like my horror movies even like the more sinister, serious ones with at least a little, just even if it's just one time I laugh in the movie, just a light, light humor in it. I enjoy it. Well, there are two that I, I want to promote. Uh, one is Beneath the Black Veil, mm -hmm. uh, uh, dire um, directed by Jason Koch. And uh, it's, it had, I'm not sure it's had a proper release yet, but I really like that movie that I like my characters in it. And then um, um, one that was made several years ago called Cut. And I don't think that Cut ever got its um, proper release out. Uh, a lot of these are low budget. Um, um, Cut was directed by David Roundtree. Mm -hmm. And it is really a good and well-made horror movie. And, um, and it's just, you cannot leave your seat because there is so much happening that if you if you turn away for a minute you will miss a huge part of the plot at the end it, it just is a movie that builds and i just thought it was very well made i don't have a huge part and i play susan lanier horror grown-up horror film director mm -hmm. um and my uh, we go into a, a, a equipment shop for photo equipment and i have with me my ingenue Gabrielle Stone, who is actually Dee Wallace's biological, real and real life daughter, who stars in this movie with me, and uh, and so it was this um, uh, and six degrees of separation uh, kind of thing because I'm playing the hard 
film director, and she's my ingenue. <laughs> and uh, I just adore Gabrielle Stone. She's a wonderful actress, just like Dee is. And um, so anyway, uh, they uh, Dee lives fairly nearby. And at one time, Michael lived nearby. He's now moved to Florida. But um, we've all stayed in touch and uh, have all really, you know, had, we like each other. I, I, I'm in touch with Janice Blythe and um, Marty. And uh, so, you know, um, a lot of the others have passed on, but it, it's uh, it, it's been a blessing. That's awesome. As far as you guys still staying connected, I think that's a beautiful thing. It's kind of sad when you see people that have been saying movies together and quite a few movies together, and then for whatever reason, they just have a falling out later on down the road. And it's just, it's cool. I'm happy that you guys are still, you still keep in contact with each other and still, you're still friends. And it's all awesome. Michael Berman all the time. I mean, uh, we, we probably connect several times a month, even though he's moved to Florida. He used to be a neighbor and we just hung out all the time do, doing holidays together as well. But um, I miss him, but um, we talk at least twice a month. So. That's good. That's awesome. Excuse me. Yep, no problem. Okay. Oh, yeah, that, that's really cool though. Like I, I, love hear, I love hearing stories like that. And I, I like to hear stories where people are still cool I like to hear the stories where it's like, well, you know, on set we were friends and we did, you know, play pranks on each other and, you know, just fun stuff like that. Because you don't really get to hear that. You don't really hear that unless you're either inter you're in an interview or you're at a con. You don't yeah. just hear that just out of nowhere. No, well, you know, Michael did all the conventions. Michael still works as an actor, but he really enjoyed the conventions and he didn't mind the traveling and he loves to meet his friend fans. Uh, some actors love that and some don't. And uh, um, I know that this pandemic has put a damper on his ability to go do conventions. And so I hope they come up with another uh, way to do it where people will actually attend and participate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they will. It'll take a little bit of time, but I'm sure they will. And him, I was actually supposed to meet him at a con, I don't know if it was this year or last year, but the con ended up getting canceled. I'm just like, oh, my goodness. that's. He was on, like, one of my lists because when I go to these cons, I'll, I'll see everybody that's going there. But, okay, I already have their autographs, so I don't got to get those. But then I have my make up my list of, like, autographs I want to get. And I'll, what I do when I go to cons now, when my wife was with me, because I'm like a child at these cons. <laughs> I can't help it. I just... You know, you have the kids, you let them go off in the store and pick out whatever they want. That's pretty much what I'm doing at cons. But then it's like, okay, now we're here Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I get my autographs usually Friday. By Friday night, I'm almost broke. Because I'm like, okay, I want to buy this, 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 this. So I just give her the money. And if it's something that I really, really want, I'm like, okay, let me, let me get my money to get this. And then you hold the right. Are you sure you want me to? Yes, hold this because you know how I am. And it's just, I'm, I just get so excited when I go there. And again, like I said, I love. I love getting my autographs and I love supporting the vendors because I know that's, you know, they have to spend the hard money to get that section that they have. And they want to make, they want to make money, of course, and they have some cool items. I'm like, let me support that. And then you just, I never regret spending my money there. I, but listen, when I go to these cons and, and I'm selling my pictures, I usually uh, spend the money on the vendors who have the coolest stuff yes. and they have really cool horror stuff. So I miss the availability of all of, of all of that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's cool, like skull necklaces and, uh, you know, uh, bracelets and tops and t-shirts and hoodies. And sometimes they'll gift me with my own picture. If my own picture's on it, which it is, I just, uh, somebody just mailed me a tote bag the other day and there was a huge picture of me on the tote bag. And I just love that, that they did that. But, um, I found myself on sweatshirts and stuff and, and so um, sometimes they'll give it to me, and it, and it's really cool. And a guy made me these incredible things. I don't know where I'm going to wear them. Maybe on Halloween I'll do a um, a Zoom and wear my things. <laughs> there you go. But it's, it's really cool. And it, it, another thing I find, I, I love how, like here's saying, how you spend your money with the vendors. I love seeing the celebrities go spend their money with the with the vendors too, and not expecting to get, to get something just because of who they are. Like, hey, you know, I love what, you know, I love your work. I love what you made. I want to buy this. And yet, sometimes they do get things for free, which I I think that's also awesome as well. But it's just, 
I don't know. I just, I just miss these cons so much, so much, so much. And yes, like I said, the virtual thing, I'll probably pay more attention when the next virtual ones come around and I will participate any way that I can, but I still miss just the in-person interaction. I do agree with you more about how it's just a lot more convenient. You can probably get a lot more people to attend them via Zoom, especially around now, which is also great. So I just, I'm excited. I just can't wait for the next, I can't wait for that next step to actually happen. Uh, they'll open back up one day. I hope, maybe. I mean, I, I, who knows what's going to happen. I, 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 I have faith that they'll come out with a, a great treatment. And, and it might not even be a vaccine. It might just be a treatment. Like if you get it here, have this shot or antibiotic, just like when I catch bronchitis or a cold or a flu, you know, I go to the doctor, they give me some pills and it goes away. So, um, you know, hopefully they'll either come up with a vaccine or a treatment and it'll be no big deal and we can resume things as they were, like you said, better than normal. So um, um, that's what I think we all should hope for. I'm, I'm, I agree with you one billion percent on that. So I want to thank you for coming on. I had a great, we had a great, great, deep, awesome conversation and I know it's a horror podcast, but sometimes you just got to get certain things out there off your, you know, get it off your chest and, Hopefully we open up a lot of ears and eyes and hearts with this conversation. So thank you so, so much for coming on here. Greatly appreciate it. And if there's anything you have to say or you want to plug, feel free. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. And, and I think that the, the times allow for us to get a little um, things off our chest from time to time. It's, it's rough times for some people. Uh, but uh, for, uh, to keep up with me, um, I, all my social media, Suze Lanier Bramlett, on Instagram is Suze Lanier, uh, Twitter, Suze Lanier, and Suze Lanier Bramlett, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can find out what I'm doing on those, and I also have a, a, a Facebook public page as Suze Lanier Bramlett, so um, you can keep up with the films and projects that I have coming out. I have a TV webisode coming out that's kind of horror um, uh, based. It's called The Red Rooms and that's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be streaming. So I hope you guys will look for that. Awesome. That's That sounds great. And I have a CD coming out too. So uh, that'll be available and you can find out all about that on uh, my uh, pages. That's awesome. Again, thank you so much for coming on. I had a wonderful time. Thanks, Every, all, all my listeners go there. Follow her everywhere. She's an amazing, amazing person, which you guys will hear from this interview. And you'll be able to find this interview on YouTube, Horror Research 30. Any any platform you listen to the podcast, Horror Research 30. I also have a Facebook group where you can feel free to share anything and everything horror-related, Horror Research 30. And I have a Facebook page where I post just about the podcast and stuff like that, coming up what I'm doing when these cons come back, Horror Research 30. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for the support. And as always, I'll see you.